hundreds of American servicemen have died or suffered injury after direct interactions with anomalous, unidentified craft. This is the bombshell revelation by Dr. Christopher Green, a neuroimaging expert who has worked with the CIA for decades. The revelation comes courtesy of a Freedom of Information Act request after the congressional funding of a research program looking into probing the nature of the often witnessed phenomenon. Part of that effort includes a look at how these anomalous vehicles, or phenomena, as it's impossible to assume that all instances of UAPs are in fact physical vehicles, interact with humans, and any possible harmful side effects. In a paper entitled Clinical, Medical, Acute, and Subacute Field Effects on Human Dermal and Neurological Tissues, Dr. Green describes multiple different types of injuries suffered by military personnel after encounters rated as 3 and 4 on the unofficial Hynek scale better known as the Close Encounter Scale. The Hynek Scale includes six levels of classification for UFO events, starting at one, which is known as nocturnal lights. This type of encounter is self-explanatory, simply witnessing strange lights in the night sky. A level two event is a direct observation of an apparent physical craft during the daytime, with the craft usually being disc or oval in shape. There's nothing to prevent a nighttime sighting from rising to level two though, if it occurs at proximity enough to actually discern what appears to be a physical craft. Note that we keep saying things like appears to be a physical craft, because there is a growing consensus amongst investigative bodies that the UFO UAP phenomenon may not be entirely physical in nature, and rather might include events that are purely or partially psychological. This includes instances where eyewitnesses describe a craft and achieve a group consensus only to later check the video or photo evidence and realize that the object was completely different than they remembered. A level 3 event includes visual sightings backed up by radar data. There are numerous such events throughout history, but one of the earliest and best attested to was the encounter by an RB-47 electronic warfare aircraft in 1957, which was bombarded by radar in a nearly 360-degree pattern by an object witnessed by the flight crew and confirmed by ground radar stations. The object proceeded to follow the aircraft for approximately 500 miles, with radar observations directly matching visual observations of the object's reported movements. At level 4, we move to the Close Encounters table, made famous by Steven Spielberg's famous UFO film. A level 4 event, known as a close encounter of the first kind, includes the visual sighting for a UFO from less than 500 feet, or 150 meters. These encounters include fine observational details of the object and include events such as the numerous sightings of UFO over nuclear weapon sites in both the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Many also consider the Phoenix Lights incident to be a CE-1 event for many observers such as Arizona Governor Fife Symington, who at the time had mocked the event in a bid to lower fear intentions, but in 2007 revealed in a public interview that when he had heard of the avalanche of reports to police of a triangular craft, quickly drove to a lookout point near his house and directly witnessed the massive triangular craft fly directly over his head. The fact that the craft was extremely massive, moved with no noise and had no discernible propulsion system or similarity to any known US craft, prompted the classification of his sighting as a CE-1 event. A level 4 event, or a close encounter of the second kind, which Dr. Green's study focused mostly on, is an event that produces a directly observable or measurable physical effect. Typically, this involves very close proximity, such as the Rendlesham UFO incident, where a US Air Force lieutenant colonel and a troop of security personnel came in extremely close proximity to a UFO, or incidents where the UFO leaves behind physical evidence of its presence. The 1964 Lonnie Zamora incident is one of the best-known CE2 events, resulting in tracks left on the ground by the alleged UFO, as well as elevated radiation levels in conjunction with those tracks. Burned vegetation from the craft allegedly firing a jet of flame before rising into the sky was also discovered by the US Air Force researchers. While the scale continues to include sightings of physical beings, Dr. Green's study focused on the last two events. He describes hundreds of military servicemen who have often had radar data to back up sightings of objects, ranging from large, silent craft that moved in erratic ways to craft that seemed to change shape or disappear and reappear at will. These injuries included incidents of surface or skin-level radiation burns, paralysis, and in some cases brain damage. In many cases, the injuries suffered by servicemen are likened to those inflicted upon US diplomats and embassy staff across the world, known as Havana Syndrome. In the case of Havana Syndrome, US intelligence believes that American staff are being targeted by microwave and high-energy weapons by a foreign actor, with suspicions that the attacks are being carried out by Russian agents. 
The similarity to Havana Syndrome and the known effects of EM radiation on the human body led Dr. Green to believe that service members were being affected by the side effects of the anomalous craft's propulsion system. Per Green, some of the injuries arose from being too close to, quote, subtle, highly powered, highly modulated microwaves. The difference between these incidents and Havana Syndrome, however, is that they predate the Havana incidents, which began in 2016, by decades. Dr. Green has admitted that details of his research remain classified but pointed out that his study was one of 38 commissioned by the Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Applications Program, which ran from 2007 to 2012. According to Green, a number of senior leaders inside the DoD at the time believed that the source of the injuries was real, physical craft of non-human origin, and that there was significant concern inside the Pentagon as to the ongoing effects on U.S. service members. Green also stated that he has been investigating anomalous injuries on U.S. service members since 1969 though only a portion of these are from UFO UAP events. However, of those that do involve UAP, these cases include sightings of apparently physical objects at close proximity and in very good visual conditions. Some of these cases even include incidents that occurred in battlefield conditions. Green might have hinted at more direct involvement with UAP by stating that some cases were even, quote, in circumstances of test and evaluation at advanced facilities. However, he may have simply been referring to staff working on exotic but very human propulsion techniques. Green stated that some incidents involved objects moving at extraordinary speeds or instantly appearing and reappearing in separate positions. When these objects come close to observers, some service members become unconscious, waking up later with radiation burns or other injuries. Most disturbingly, one in ten witnesses to these very close encounters would die within seven years of their encounter. Incredibly, some of these injuries occurred near the White House or the Capitol Mall, though Green states that he did not personally treat these cases and refused to comment further. Another disturbing finding was numerous cases of U.S. service members reporting an encounter with what they described as a cloaked humanoid entity. This is attestable outside of Green's report, with encounters involving cloaked entities spanning the globe and ranging from sightings in nuclear weapons storage depots to deep in the wilderness. The numerous sightings of these phenomenon outside of any observed UAP event hint that they may not necessarily be related. Green's report stated that while the injuries being suffered by U.S. service members were anomalous, they were, in fact, capable of being caused by technology available in 2010 when he wrote the report. Electromagnetic weapons had already been tested at that time that could produce second-degree burns on subjects from several hundred meters away, as well as cause intestinal distress or sensations of burning. Since then, we've seen the technology adapted for use as a crowd control weapon. In his report, Green also states that successful tests using EM devices to produce audible voices inside people's heads had been conducted by thermoelastic expansion of intracranial spaces. Next time a crazy person tells you the government is putting voices in their head, it might be worth giving them a listen. However, Green's acknowledgement that the technology exists to create some of these effects was not an admission that similar devices were responsible for the cases he treated. For starters, many of these date back to his start in 1969, when the technology was impractical to be used on a battlefield. Rather, Green's focus was to work backward from known technology to ascertain how these effects are being generated by observed UAP, leading to the realization that these crafts were emitting blasts of radiation as part of their propulsion. Given their transmedium properties or ability to effortlessly shift from space to air to water, as well as extreme feats of speed and maneuverability, it's believed that these crafts may move by warping space around them, resulting in the release of high-energy microwaves and ultraviolet waves. The AAWSAP program that Green was involved in investigated a prominent case of injury suffered by exposure to UAP phenomenon, resulting in significant health issues. The case involved a biotechnologist whose identity was kept secret to protect his privacy, but who witnessed three blue orbs flying in a field near Bend, Oregon in May of 2005. He and his daughter, who was out for a ride at the time, watched the orbs fly around the field until they seemed to take note of them, at which point they rapidly approached their vehicle. Approximately the size of a softball, the blue orbs flew through the vehicle, with one passing through the man's chest and arm. The man would begin to feel dizzy and nauseous in the following days and soon started losing his hearing and eyesight. He would be diagnosed with a rare type of cancer in his chest. Green isn't the only person that the U.S. Department of Defense reached out to over concerns that the UAP were harming U.S. service members. Dr. Gary Nolan, professor of pathology at Stanford University, has been unapologetic about his research into the UFO phenomenon. He first became interested after hearing of a possible alien remains. The small skeleton was indeed highly anomalous 
but a study of the remains revealed numerous mutations in skeletal genes which likely explained the strange biology, as Nolan would explain. His study of the Atacama skeleton drew the attention of the CIA and a number of aerospace contractors. He was asked to study a number of American pilots who had come into close contact with UAP and suffered adverse effects from it. Some of the effects the pilots suffered were rather extreme, including scarring of brain tissue itself, also known as white matter disease. Per Nolan's estimate, he looked at about 100 patients, not just pilots, but personnel working across the military, government, and aerospace sectors. What Nolan and his team discovered is that people who have claimed to have had a UAP experience had what he described as, quote, overconnection of neurons between the head of the caudate and the putamen. This area of the brain is associated with perception and poses the question of if these overconnections existed prior to the sighting or if the sighting was possible exactly because of these overconnections. In other words, Nolan proposed as a hypothesis that perhaps people with overdeveloped sensory abilities are more likely to spot the phenomenon, indicating that at some level, UAPs may be either affecting human perception or more likely to be perceived by a certain segment of the population. Even more curious, when Nolan investigated the MRIs of several dozen patients, he found that people with this overdeveloped region of the brain are more likely to seek out a partner with a similar condition than not. Could there be a UFO gene? Or could mankind be evolving over time to better identify a phenomenon perceived as a potential threat? Nolan's interest in this phenomenon led him to investigate alleged recovered materials from UFOs. In one case, his team analyzed debris left behind by an alleged UAP with some curious results. Known as the Council Bluffs incident, the event occurred on Saturday, December 17, 1977, in Council Bluffs, Iowa. At approximately 7.45 p.m., two residents of Council Bluffs witnessed a red orb falling to earth near the northern end of the town. It did not appear to be in complete freefall, but it was moving rapidly enough to indicate an imminent crash. Moments later, the object disappeared below the horizon line, followed by a bright flash of light and tall flames. Upon reaching the scene, the witnesses discovered an area covered by molten metal, which glowed red hot and had set the grass on fire. Arriving police and a fireman who were on the scene 15 minutes later estimated that the mass was about 35 to 55 pounds and still liquid enough to boil and run along the contours of the terrain. There was no crater to indicate an impact, and the center of the mass of molten metal remained warm for over two hours. The site was near a local airport, and at first some sort of accident was suspected. However, the airport reported no accident or in-flight emergency from any of its craft, and the lack of the impact crater made a meteor highly unlikely. Chemical analysis at Iowa State University and Griffin Pipe Products Company found that the material was a metallic alloy mostly made up of iron with small parts of nickel and chromium. The scientists concluded that the sample was likely carbon steel that had been cast and then reheated to 1,000 degrees before being cooled. However, that explanation doesn't account for how a very large amount of very heavy steel could have been deposited at the site, still in a completely molten state. Nor were any explanations offered for the luminous object viewed by the two witnesses, who were deemed responsible for depositing the pool of molten metal. Within an hour of the event, an additional 11 witnesses came forward, all of whom attested to observing the same object. Witnesses described a bright, quote, reddish ball that fell straight down to earth followed by a bright flash and flames as reported by the original witnesses. Further investigation revealed additional witnesses throughout the community, including some who had a much better and closer vantage point. One couple who'd been driving nearby at the time reported seeing a round object with bright red lights blinking in sequence around its periphery. The object hovered stationary for a few moments before the witnesses lost sight of it. It was thus speculated that the object had not crashed, but rather rapidly descended to treetop height and then ejected the molten mass for some unknown purpose. The U.S. Air Force responded to the Council Bluffs police request for aid in the case. Their report suggested the object had been space debris, but the Air Force countered that the object was unlikely to be space debris as re-entering debris does not impact in a molten state. The lack of a crater or indentation also hinted that it could not have been space debris, as did the fact that the object was seen glowing at elevation of only a few hundred feet, and space debris does not remain glowing at that altitude. Further, the analysis of the molten material revealed no structure, thus making it unlikely it had ever been a manufactured space object. Strangely, though, the Air Force concluded that the incident did not merit further analysis or investigation. With the debris and aircraft accident theory out, some suggested it was a hoax perpetrated with the use of thermite. Yet when witnesses arrived on scene, the metal was still in a liquid state, 
and the chemical analysis revealed no trace of thermite. Further, it does not explain the nearly two dozen witnesses who had seen the orb-like objects with varying degrees of detail given their vantage points. Another theory positing that a hoaxer had simply poured molten metal in the area was deemed almost certainly impossible given the amount of equipment needed to keep some of the material liquid in the first place and the fact that no metallurgical plant in the area had done any pouring on that day. Nolan's modern investigation into a sample of the material revealed that it had been incompletely mixed, further baffling researchers into the material's origin or purpose. One hypothesis was that the material could have been part of an advanced type of exotic nuclear reactor known today, but the sample was missing some of the elements for the type of materials needed for such a reactor to work properly. There have been 15 known cases of material ejected by UAPs, though we only have a few samples available for study. Some of these samples indicated extreme levels of purity, which would have been very expensive to manufacture at the time, such as a sample recovered from Ubatuba in Brazil, where a UAP ejected a form of nearly pure magnesium. The fact that the chain of custody on that sample is questionable in places, though, and the ability to easily obtain a similar composition sample today makes this a difficult case to verify. It's difficult to verify materials of non-human origin, given the long historical timelines and problems with verifying chain of custody. But Dr. Nolan's efforts are part of a growing scientific push into the serious investigations of UAP. This effort faces a historical counter-push from establishment academia who perpetuates ridicule culture around the phenomenon while offering no plausible explanations for the physical, electronic, and witness evidence indicating the presence of UAP on Earth. With growing pressure from the public and even defense officials, though, a demand for a serious investigation into the phenomenon has resulted in a new effort by the Department of Defense and the growth of civilian-led efforts such as the Seoul Foundation and the Galileo Project. While we cannot ascertain the true identity of the UAP, we do have evidence that even if not outright hostile to human life, they are disturbingly hazardous to our health, and this warrants serious and immediate consideration. Now go check out UFO Chased a US Military Plane, or click this other video instead.